Hello, hello, and welcome to my channel, or welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be reading you four different ghost stories from the Haunted Canada series. Let's begin. The doctor is in Hamilton House, Victoria, British Columbia. Museums are like windows that offer views of times, places long past. Old houses that have been turned into museums are especially fascinating. As you move through their historically furnished rooms, you can imagine the people who live there going about their daily tasks. Items such as dishes on the tables and handmade quilts on the beds give the impression that their original owners are expected back any minute. Maybe imaginations work over time in old places like these. Whatever the reason, it's not all the usual for people touring them to report seeing and hearing some pretty spooky things. Hamilton House in downtown Victoria is an old house that has been turned into a museum. It gives visitors a taste of what life British Columbia was like about 150 years ago. Apparently, some visitors have also experienced enough strange sights and sounds that the place is said to be haunted. Hamilton House is the oldest house in British Columbia, still in place on its original foundations. It started out as a three-room log home built by Dr. John Sebastian Hamilton in 1852. Dr. Hamilton had trained as a doctor in England and came to Canada as a ship's surgeon for the Hudson Bay Company. It was also a doctor for the company that he settled at Fort Victoria. There, Helmican fell in love and married Cecilia Douglas, the daughter of the colony's governor, Sir James Douglas. It was for Cecilia that the doctor built the first part of what was to become a large, stately home and later a museum. Dr. Helmican died in 1920 at the age of 96. His youngest daughter, Edith, who had gone to live with him after her husband died in 1896, continued to live in the house until her death in 1939. Soon after, the British Columbia government bought the house and in 1941 opened it as a museum. Soon after that, the reports of unusual happenings began. Every now and then, someone sees a woman looking out a window on the second floor. Even though there's no one in the house, Helmikin's wife Cecilia loved her new home, but she didn't get to live in it very long. She died when she was just 31. It's said that she couldn't bear to leave the house forever, and that she's the woman in the window. There have also been reports of piano music coming from the house when it's empty. Strange things happen when staff and visitors are in the house too. For example, lights go on by themselves, dishes are moved around the kitchen, and thick, heavy doors swing open on their own. Mark Vermetti, a manager of the house, figures Dr. Helmican and Edith are the invisible spirits who are making their presence known. Over the years, he's come to think of them as friends, but a few unsuspecting workers and visitors have been very distraught by their encounters with the ghosts of Helmican House, and for them, one visit to the museum has been one visit too many. Dung Arvin Whipper, Miramichi, New Brunswick. If you've ever heard the blood-curdling, ear-slitting cry of the Dung Garvin Whipper, her, you wouldn't be easily convinced that the story behind the bellful moan is just a legend. Instead, you'd most likely join the ranks of those who've said over the years, I've heard it, it's true, there really is a ghost roaming the banks of the Dungard. There are at least two versions of the story behind those horrible sounds, but the basic details are the same. Apparently, sometime around 1860, a young man known only by his name Ryan signed on to be the cook at a logging camp near the Dungarvan River a branch of the main Rennius River in New Brunswick. Ryan was a friendly, outgoing fellow, well liked by the other loggers. He was also a bit too trusting for his own good. He made no secret of the fact that he kept his savings in a money belt he wore around his waist. Every morning, Ryan would make, make breakfast for the men. When it was ready, he would let out a loud whooping yell to wake them up, and he would pack their lunch pails, and after they left, set about baking, preparing supper. One day, the foreman stayed behind with Ryan. What happened next depends on who's telling the story. One version has the boss murdering Ryan for his money hiding his body under the snow and telling the other men that the cook had left while they were gone. The more popular version has the foreman murdering Ryan for his money in the bunkhouse. When the other men returned to camp and found the young man's body on the floor, the boss told them Ryan had suddenly become ill and died. A fierce winter storm blew in that evening, piling up meter-high snowdrifts, and stopped the crew from taking Ryan's body out of the bush for a proper funeral. The men were forced to bury his corpse in a shallow grave. That night was a living hell for the men at the camp. The first nerve-wracking whoops pierced the silence of the forest shortly after the dark. As the night went on, the horrifying wails grew louder, making sleep an impossibility by working, making sleep an impossibility by mourning 
the men had enough. Convinced that they were hearing the mournful cries of the dead Ryan, they packed up and left the camp, vowing never to return. Apparently the foreman got away with murder, but it's as if Ryan's ghost found a way to make sure no one forgot his tragedy. For years afterwards, people reported hearing hair-raising screams as if they found themselves near the place where Ryan was said to have been buried. There were even reports of a ghost-like figure rising from the ground, screeching and wailing. If someone stepped too close to the supposed grave site, some sightings have ghosts swooping closer and closer until it hovers just overhead, filling the air with ear-splitting will. In the early 1900s, a local priest, Father Edward Murdoch, traveled to the spot known as Whooper Spring and blessed the area to bring peace to Ryan's troubled soul and to the people terrified by the unearthly sound. Some say the prayers worked and that the other woods around the grave site were quiet. Others say that wasn't the case and that reports of the haunting screams still continue to filter out of the forest. The Dungarvan Whooper is probably New Brunswick's most famous ghost. In 1912, Michael Whalen, known as the poet Rhineus, published a ballad called The Dungarvan Whipper. In it, he recounted all the details about the ghost that he'd heard over his lifetime, and a train that ran through the region until 1936 also kept the story of Ryan's murder in people's minds. Perhaps it was because the train had been loaded with rowdy lumberjacks, whipping it up as they went to and from the bush. Or maybe it was just because the haunting sound of the whistle made as the train rumbled by. Whatever the reason, the train was known as the Dungarvan Whooper. Rescue from the Grave, Fox River, Nova Scotia As a sea captain, George Hatfield was often away from his home at Fox River, west of Parsboro, for months at a time. In March 1876, he was still a few weeks from home, sailing north from Cuba to Boston in stormy Atlantic waters. After a harrowing day at the helm, Hatfield decided to go below for some much-needed sleep. Soon after he nodded off, he felt a hand on his shoulder and heard someone tell him to alter his course. But when he rolled over and looked around his cabin, there was nobody there. Hatfield figured his first mate must have left right after delivering his message. So he headed back up to the bridge to find out what was going on. When he got on deck, he found his mate at the wheel, carefully steering the ship through the treacherous waves. Hatfield asked the man why he didn't want to follow the course that had been set, but the mate had no idea what his captain was talking about. Hatfield felt more than a little foolish, deciding that he must have dreamed the visitor in his cabin. He went below and stretched out on his bunk again, but once more his sleep was interrupted in exactly the same way. Angry, he went back up to ask the first mate why he wanted to change course and why he hadn't stayed. He discussed the matter after waking him up. Poor mate said he hadn't left his post, nor had any other member of the crew. Confused, Hatfield tried once again to get some rest. He had barely closed his eyes when he felt when he again felt someone tapping his shoulder and ordering him in a firm, loud voice to make a specific course change. This time, though, when the captain looked up, he saw a man he didn't recognize leaving his cabin. He jumped up and hurried back up to the stairs when he reached the first mate. He asked him if he had seen someone walking along the deck. The mate said no. Hatfield looked around for a few seconds, then turned to the worried man and ordered him to alter the ship's course in the way the voice had described. Then the cab- captain returned to his cabin and fell into a deep sleep. The mate was afraid his captain might be suffering from extreme exhaustion, but he did as he was told. He was still steering the new course when Hatfield appeared back on deck that next morning, looking rested but anxious. Hatfield ordered his crew to keep a close watch on the sea ahead. A few hours later, he heard a cry that he seemed to be expecting. One of his men had spotted a battered ship that appeared to be taking on water at a deadly rate. Through a series of dangerous maneuvers, Hatfield and his crew managed to get close enough to the American schooner D. Talbot to rescue everyone on board. The schooner's captain, a man named Amesbury, was especially grateful to Hatfield. His wife and child were among those rescued. After Amesbury and his family had dried off and had a warm drink, Hatfield sat down with them and told them how he had found them. As he was describing the strange man who had mysteriously appeared in his cabin, Miss Amesbury interrupted him and asked for more details about what the man looked like and what he was wearing. Then she started to cry. When Hatfield asked her what was wrong, she told him he had just described her father. In a trembling voice, she went on to explain that her father had died ten years earlier. Is it possible that Miss Mrs. Anne's buried father cared for her so much that he'd return from the grave to save her from certain death. Who else could have appeared to Hatfield in the middle of the Atlantic and guided him to the exact spot, in that vast ocean where this help was needed the most? Prospector's Spectre, O'Brien Creek, Yukon Territory. Fred Nelson looked as if he had been a 
as he had seen a ghost. That's because he had. Just a few days earlier, even back in the safety of Dawson, he was still filled with fear as he spoke of what happened at the mouth of O'Brien Creek, near what came to be known as Forty Mile. A reporter with the Klondike Nugget carefully observed Nelson as he told his horrifying tale. He noted how Nelson's eyes had a wild look about them, and his hands trembled. His voice even cracked as he gave a detailed account of what he and another gold prospector, a man called Swanson, had seen and heard in a two-room cabin in the wilderness. By the time Nelson had finished his story, the repeater was convinced. The reporter was convinced that it was true. No man could pretend to be that scared. Like most people in the area back then, Nelson and Swanson had heard rumors that the cabin was haunted. It had sat abandoned for 14 years ever since its owner, a prospector named LaSalle, had been found dead there in 1886. From the bloodied state of LaSalle's body, it was clear that he had been murdered. Suspicion had fallen on some Tanana natives from Alaska who were fed up with the fur traders, miners, and missionaries that kept invading their territory. However, there was no proof that the Tananas had killed LaSalle and no one was ever charged with the crime. Four years later, after LaSalle's death, stories circulated about the strange sounds coming from the cabin. Those few daring enough to go near it, natives and non-natives alike, told of being overcome by a creepy feeling as they approached the door. That weird feeling was enough to send them on their way without going inside. But the temperature had plunged to nearly 40 degrees below zero on the evening that Nelson and Swanson spotted the cabin in the distance. Faced with the very real possibility of freezing to death, they decided to take shelter in it and hope. They were nervous when they went inside, but once they got a small fire going in the old stove, they felt much calmer. Eventually, they fell asleep. At first, Nelson thought it was the howl of the wind that woke him up around midnight, but as he rolled over to get comfortable, he heard the sound again. It wasn't the wind, and it wasn't coming from outside. It was the sound of someone moaning, and it was coming from the back room. Swanson was awake by then. He had heard the moans, too. Nelson jumped up and pushed on the door, connecting the two rooms. But even though it had swung open freely earlier, it was now stuck. Swanson rammed it with his shoulder, but it wouldn't budge. At that point, Nelson thought he heard a low voice weakly pleading for help. As he pulled on his parka, he shouted at Swanson to keep trying to open the door. Then he jammed his feet into his boots and headed outside. Nelson ran around the side of the cabin, intending to break the small window in the back of the room. But when he got into it, it was filled with an eerie light. Looking inside, he saw the misty apparition of a man with a horse horrible gash on the side of his head. Petrified, Nelson stumbled back into the cabin and nearly choking with fear, told Swanson that what he had seen. Swanson backed away from the door, no longer wanting to open it. But the moans grew louder, so he edged near and in a loud voice, told whatever was in the room to identify itself. Over the next several minutes, he asked questions and got patterns of knocks in reply. When Swanson asked if the phantom was LaSalle's ghost, the knocks got louder, and when he asked the spirit who had killed him, the door suddenly burst open. Filling the doorway was a glowing image of a man, his arms stretched upward. Both Swanson and Nelson screamed, but before they could make it outside, the figure vanished. Both prospectors managed to find the courage to stay in the cabin long enough to pack up their gear. Then they slipped out into the darkness preferring to take their chances with the deadly cold rather than spend another minute in the shelter of LaSalle's cabin. Thank you for listening. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing and liking my channel, and I will see you on the next one.